Hey everybody, Mark Victor here. I'm the founder of the Live and Let Live Global Peace Movement. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about rule number one, the legal principle. This is going to be a little bit more deeper dive into what the heck is this legal principle. Well, a little background first. Think about what's the purpose of live and let live? Why are we doing this? What are we trying to accomplish with live and let live, the global peace movement? Okay, well this is sort of an easy question. We want to foster freedom and peace and prosperity around the world. We need to find a way to live together, even with people who we have basic disagreements on important, basic, fundamental issues, right? People are going to disagree. How is it that we can live together and still pursue policies that get us to freedom and peace and prosperity? Okay, well, in order to understand this, you gotta think about the difference between what's a legal rule and what's a moral rule. It's not that confusing. The world is filled with rules, right? There are all kinds of different rules. So what's really the difference between a legal rule and a moral rule? They're both important, but the difference is a legal rule, well, that's the kind of rule that if you violate, you're gonna be subject to formal societal consequences. Something's gonna happen to you. Something like maybe going to jail or prison or you could be put on probation or fined. That's a consequence. You might owe somebody money, something like that. If you violate this kind of a rule, society gets to impose a consequence on you. That's what we call a legal rule. What's a moral rule? Well, violation of a moral rule doesn't subject you to any formal societal consequence. There may be other kinds of consequences. You may lose friends. People may not want to hang around with you or do business with you if you violate certain moral rules. But that's the main difference between a legal rule and a moral rule. Why am I telling you this? Because we have got to get our morality outside the law. The problem is when we confuse the two kinds of rules. And the reason this is a problem is because we don't all agree on morality. It's okay, there are hard moral questions out there that reasonable minds can disagree upon. We don't all have to agree on morality, how people should live their lives and what's right and what's wrong. There are things about those types of higher, more complex questions that smart people, philosophers, have been debating for years, centuries, even longer than that. So we're not likely to agree on those types of questions anytime soon. That's why we can't force our moral conclusions on other people. They have a right to come to their own moral conclusions. This doesn't mean that legal rules are necessarily more important than moral rules. Moral rules are very important. That's why we have a whole moral principle, right? That's rule number two. I'm gonna talk about that in a different video. So we're not saying moral rules are not important. They're very important. We talk about them with the moral principle. Today I'm talking about the legal principle. So get the difference down between a legal rule and a moral rule. It'll be much easier to understand what the legal principle is about. Okay, so before I dive right in, I wanna do a little thought experiment. Will you do this with me? Humor me a little bit. Try something, clear your mind. If you're old enough to remember the Etch-a-Sketch, you know, when you clear the screen with the Etch-a-Sketch, can we just start from scratch here? Forget everything the Republicans have said and are saying right now. Forget everything the Democrats have said and are saying right now. Forget the Libertarians, the Independents, and if you're not in the United States, forget everything that whatever political party there is talking about. Can we start from scratch? Just get all of that stuff out of your mind. Let's start from scratch. Really what we wanna know here is, what's your position on aggression? How do you feel about aggression? Okay, in order to answer that question, I gotta break it down a little bit for you. What's aggression, right? So let's talk about that. Well, there are really four categories of aggression that I'm gonna talk about first. Aggression is somebody who initiates 
force against another person or their property. Notice I highlighted that initiates, because if somebody else initiates force against you or another person, responding to that is self-defense. Yeah, that's what self-defense is. Self-defense is a justified, reasonable response to another person's initiation of force against another person or their property. What do I mean by that? How does someone initiate force against another person? Punch him in the face, push him, hit him over the head. That's how you initiate force against another person. How do you initiate force against another person's property? Stealing their property, trespassing against their property, using their property for a period of time without their permission. Those are all initiations of force and that's what we consider aggression. I'm telling you what the live and let live definition of aggression is. First category, don't initiate force against another person or their property. Okay, that's pretty easy to understand. These are already crimes in most places. Second category, fraud. Don't be engaged in fraud. Okay, fraud is defined differently in different places. But essentially what a fraud is, is getting someone's property from them through some version of trickery, right? You're intending to trick them to get their property. You do trick them. They rely on something you said or did that's false, a false statement that makes a difference, that gets them to maybe give you their property thinking something else. They've been fooled. They've been tricked. That's what fraud is about. Fraud is the second category of aggression. That's a very serious violation of the rule not to aggress. Third category, coercion. What's coercion? Okay, coercion is when you overcome somebody's will, maybe by a threat of force, right? This is somebody who says, hey, your money or your life, and sticks a gun in your face. They haven't actually touched you yet, but if you say, ah, I'll give you my money, you didn't give it to them voluntarily. You were coerced into giving them money. Coercion is the third category of aggression. So those three categories, don't initiate force against another person or their property, don't be involved in fraud, don't be involved in coercion. What's the fourth category of aggression? Doing anything that creates a substantial risk of harm to another person or their property. Another way to say this is don't put another person in danger. Don't do anything that puts another person in a serious risk of danger. What am I talking about here? And this can be a hard category sometimes for people to understand, but we deal with this in the law all the time. I'll give you some examples of this. Somebody who maybe ingests some kind of a drug, maybe alcohol, maybe some other kind of a drug, and then can't drive safely down the road, right? Say they're driving their vehicle and they're swerving all over the place, maybe on the wrong side of the road. They have very poor judgment. This is somebody who hasn't yet used force against another person, but they're still aggressing. Why? Because they're putting another person at a substantial risk of danger. That action right there is aggression. We don't have to wait until there's a car accident. We can stop that conduct right there. Another example, somebody who recklessly fires around from their gun up into the sky. They don't know where it's going. Imagine this is in a crowded city or a residential neighborhood. That's putting other people at a substantial risk of harm. Maybe you're storing dangerous explosives in a reckless way or some other hazardous material in a residential neighborhood without taking proper safeguards so that you're putting other people at risk. All of this is aggression under the live and let live definition because you're endangering other people. There can be some hard questions here and different communities may feel differently about this. When we're evaluating what's a substantial risk, we should think about both the amount of the harm that would occur if that risk happens and how likely or unlikely it is that this risk of harm is actually going to turn into real harm. So that's sort of how we evaluate what's a substantial risk. Okay, those four categories, that's all aggression. That's how we, in the live and let live movement define aggression. If you do any one of those four categories of things, you're aggressing. Now you may have noticed I refer to those as serious violations 
of the rule not to aggress you might think of these as criminal violations in fact these are crimes in most places that's what i do i'm a criminal defense lawyer so i deal with these types of issues day in and day out and as a criminal violation or a serious violation of the rule not to aggress we should use a higher standard of proof all the things you're used to in the criminal law arena proof beyond a reasonable doubt who has the burden of proof by what standard those kinds of things and all of the other protections that go along with the criminal justice system before we're willing to say somebody violated the rule against aggression in this most serious type of a way they should have due process something close to what they receive in the criminal justice system okay there are other ways to aggress that we call less serious violations of the rule not to aggress you might think of these as civil matters i'm going to cover these really fast they're still aggressions they're just less serious aggressions what am i talking about here a breach of a contract for example you make a contract a legally binding enforceable contract which means there's been an offer that's sufficient it's been accepted and there's what we lawyers call consideration. You have a real contract and somebody violates that contract. Okay, this in essence is stealing the benefit of that contractual bargain from another person. So if you breach a contract, that's aggression. It's a less serious form of aggression. Think of that as a civil violation. Also what we lawyers call a tort, negligent conduct. You unreasonably injure another person what am i talking about here I'm talking about driving your vehicle in a careless kind of a way maybe you have a fender bender with another person you're still responsible for that that violates the rule against aggression you might owe damages to that person again a civil matter third category of this less serious violation of the rule not to aggress what we call breach of a fiduciary duty what am i talking about here talking about a parent who's not taking care of their kid or some such similar situation a parent who's depriving a child of basic necessities for food and shelter and clothing those kinds of things that breaches a special duty in the law that we call a fiduciary duty and the parent can suffer consequences as a result of not properly caring for the child. It's an obligation they undertook when they decided to have a child. Okay, those are civil violations. They're less serious violations of the rule not to aggress, but violations nonetheless. We deal with them like we deal with any other civil case. Generally, the burden of proof is lower with the less serious violation than with the more serious violation. So, Generally, the standard of proof here is what we call preponderance, 50% plus a feather. Who do we believe more? That's the winner of the case. Still, the person who brings the claim has the burden of proof. In the civil case, we call that person a plaintiff. Okay, that's what aggression is. My question to you, how do you feel about aggression? Should people be allowed to aggress or not? And what we are saying in the live and let live movement is no you should never be allowed to aggress rule number one our most basic rule in the live and let live movement that we call the legal principle can be accurately described as simply don't be an aggressor or don't aggress against other people or their property do you feel differently about that i hope not how could we possibly get to freedom or peace if we're coercing each other, if we're hitting each other over the head. In fact, I often say there is no other way to get to freedom and peace unless you reject aggression. You can't both be in favor of aggressing against other people and be in favor of peace. The hypocrisy of such a position will not be lost on other people. So as a result, because we are really against aggression, we're against aggression on all issues, for all people. We don't treat anybody differently. This applies to people no matter what color their skin is, no matter where they were born, regardless of what religious views they have or don't have, who they love, what holidays they celebrate, doesn't matter. No exceptions. Nobody gets to aggress against any other person. This is a mandatory rule. 
you don't have an option to aggress we don't listen to say for example a thief who says I'm gonna steal your property and you might say no you're not mr. thief I'm gonna stop you if I can we don't listen to the thief if the thief was to say I didn't consent to that rule I don't agree to not be an aggressor sorry you don't get to aggress and that's a very important point that's why we say rule number one the legal principle the rule against aggression is mandatory nobody should have an option to violate rule number one this has to be our first point of agreement we can't even have another rule unless we first agree on the rule not to aggress against each other imagine making another rule while we're still aggressing against each other doesn't really make sense think of two people who disagree on everything maybe they don't get along maybe they're even at war with each other what would be the very first rule that they could agree on how about you stop aggressing against me and I'll stop aggressing against you it's our basic rule it's likely the first rule that two humans ever agreed on it has to be our number one basic rule we can't get anything done if we're aggressing against each other therefore it applies to all people now very important point right here is no exceptions all people all issues all times all cases rule number one the legal principle applies it doesn't matter if people form little groups imagine you and a couple of neighbors get together Do you get to aggress against other people we say absolutely not why on earth would we prohibit people from aggressing against others but then let them form groups and say well now it's okay for them to aggress it doesn't make any sense what if the group is bigger does that change anything of course it doesn't change anything why would we say that just because people have formed a big group they should now be able to aggress even if the majority of people in that group vote to aggress aggression is still wrong that's right even if they have a full and fair and free election on the point aggression still remains wrong it remains wrong even if the majority of people no longer know the difference between right and wrong it also applies to corporations why would we ever allow a corporation to initiate force fraud coercion or do anything to put anyone else at a substantial risk of harm we should demand exactly the same standard from corporations as we demand from individuals in small groups and large groups even the largest group of all the government why on earth wouldn't we seek to hold the government to exactly the same standard we hold each other to after all the government comes from us the government can't have special rights we created the government if there's no us if there's no people there's no government we create the government and because we create the government we delegate some of our rights to the government well if we don't have a right to aggress and I just suggest we don't have a right to aggress then you can't delegate a right to aggress to the government so the government can't have a right to aggress because the only place the government can get its rights from is from us there's no other place for the government to get rights and why would we ever want the government to initiate force against another person or their property they can defend us no problem self-defense is fine but do we really want the government to be engaging in fraud or in coercion or to be doing things that put us at a substantial risk of harm that's why we hold the government to exactly the same standard we hold every person every group and every corporation so let me finish by saying we really buy in to rule number one the legal principle don't be an aggressor and I ask you to just think about it a little bit is there ever a time when you think aggressing as I've explained it here in this video is the right thing to do if you agree with us that aggression is wrong then it's wrong on all issues at all times and in all cases and all we do with this is seek to reason consistently from this principle we're not trying to smuggle in any other philosophy or get to some conclusion on some issue through some trickery or sneak in or smuggle in some type of conclusion no 
we want to reason consistently with this principle, the live and let live legal principle on all issues. So let me just leave you with a little bit of the methodology in terms of how do we analyze an issue, whatever the issue is. If you said to me, hey, Mark, do you think this should be legal or illegal? I'm going to say, well, tell me what's going on. And what I'm listening for is the answer to the question, is somebody violating the live and let live legal principle? Is somebody aggressing against another person or their property in some way? Because if they are, I'm always against it. I'm always going to say that should be illegal. We should never permit aggression. Even if the person is aggressing to try to get to some great goal because they want to accomplish something good. Even if it's the kind of thing I agree with that we should accomplish, I'm not going to violate rule number one and aggress against other people in order to accomplish whatever result I think is important. You know, one of the main reasons I'm not going to do that because other people have different ideas about the world. If we can aggress to get done what we want to get done, then other people will want to aggress to try to get done what they want to get done. The only way out of this is for us to say, we got to get those things done outside of the law. The great moral ideas that we have, and I can tell you some of the ones I have, because I'm a believer in rule number two, which I'm going to talk about in a future video. I think we should be good humans. I want to help those less fortunate. I want to help them have access to health care, and I want to make sure that we take care of people who can't take care of themselves, and they should get access to good education. All those are goals of mine, as well as many people, if not all people, in the Live and Let Live movement. What we're not willing to do is to coerce, initiate force, use fraud, do any aggression whatsoever to get that done. Because as soon as we say it's okay to accomplish our moral goals, other people have different moral goals and they will seek to put those in the law. The only way we can address this problem is either one of two ways. We can either say, sorry, my morality is more important. My morality is better than your morality. That gets us here which is where we are right now. Everybody's fighting everybody else to try to force everybody else to live in ways they think they should live. The other option is to say, sorry, we take all of our morality out of the law. The only thing that goes in the law is the legal principle, and that's it. Don't be an aggressor. Everything else are moral questions, which we should still do. We should persuade people into our morality not force them into our morality. If you gotta coerce somebody to accept your morality, that's probably a good sign that your morality is not very good. Persuade them, convince them, treat them like other brothers and sister human beings because that's what they really are. So we always wanna reason consistently from the live and let live legal principle. No matter what the issue is, if somebody's aggressing, I'm against it. If nobody's aggressing, they should be left alone. And the reason I say it like that is because if you don't leave them alone, then you're aggressing and whoever's aggressing is in the wrong. Okay, so that's a little bit about the methodology in terms of how we think through all issues. I'm not gonna go through any specific issues in this video. Just wanted to give you a sort of a dive into the legal principle, but I am gonna cut a video that you'll receive hopefully soon where I will apply the legal principle and the moral principle to a whole host of different issues to give you a feel of how we reason through some of these issues. Okay, so there's the dive into rule number one, also known as the live and let live legal principle. I broke down for you what a serious violation of that principle is, right? Initiating force, fraud, coercion, or doing anything that puts another person at a substantial risk of harm, and also less serious violations of that rule. Things like breaches of contracts, torts, which is negligence, slip and falls, fender benders, think of those types, accidents, if you will, and also those important breaches of fiduciary duties, failing in your duty, to take care of another person that you have. This is a legal duty that you acquire by maybe having a kid or agreeing to be a guardian, something like that. 
don't do those things. Don't aggress. And it applies to everyone, groups, corporations, governments. If you got that down, if that makes sense to you, then you're well on your way to being a good live and let live type of a person. So anyways, my name's Mark Victor. You can always get a hold of me through the Live and Let Live website where there's much more information on all of the things I talked about here today. It's just liveandletlive.org. Peace.